Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition. In the previous video, we looked at the rationale for using mega doses of thiamine. We looked at the potential mechanisms by which that works. In today's video, we will be looking specifically at some of the side effects that can occur when someone does undertake this therapy. Now, I've come to the conclusion that there's three main areas that generally need improvement or need work when someone does take thiamine and they experience side effects. So those three areas involve the electrolytes, particularly magnesium and potassium in some cases, glutathione status, so ensuring that someone has gl good glutathione status and good glutathione recycling capacity, and thirdly is methylation status. If someone has poor methylation, then taking mega doses of thiamine in specific forms um, this can sometimes be taxing methylation further, and I think some of the side effects are potentially due to that effect. So this video will apply to all the concepts in this video that we'll discuss. They do, in a roundabout way, apply to all forms of B1, but they are going to mostly apply to thiamine in its TTFD form, thiamine tetrahydrofurfal disulfide. The reason why I say this is because this is the primary form of thiamine that I use in clinical practice. This type of thiamine is the one which produces the most side effects in my opinion. And secondly, uh, thirdly, this is the form which is the most potent. And I often find that if someone cannot tolerate this form, we need to do further work on some of these areas that I'm going to discuss today. And then they can gradually find that they will be able to incorporate TTFD, incorporate another form of thiamine and get to a point where they can actually tolerate the therapeutic dose. So the key points for today's video are that many people experience difficult side effects and strange, unpleasant symptoms when starting thiamine supplementation. Now, this is particularly pronounced when using high doses, and it's also more common when using more bioavailable forms, such as benfotiamine or thiamine tetrahydrofurfural disulfide. Dr. Derek Lonsdell, who is really the pioneer of this type of therapy, at least in the Western world, he referred to this as the paradoxical reaction. So the paradoxical reaction oftentimes lasts from anywhere between one week and one month, depending on each individual. The paradoxical effect is made up of a variety of different symptoms and it can affect different people in different ways. Now, what I've found personally is that people will find that they can adjust to the paradoxical effect, that they can minimize some of the side effects. These can be greatly improved, the symptoms, simply by supporting other surrounding biochemical processes, supporting nutritional status in other ways, which can potentially help the body to process B1. So one thing I would like to emphasize is that when using high doses of any kind of nutrient, I think we need to be very cautious and very mindful of the effects that this is going to have on the other nutrients that we are having in our diet or through our supplements. What this means is, is when we, when we give the body high doses of one nutrient, what this is going to do is it's going to affect the biochemical pathways which that nutrient is involved in. And it might also be having effect on other pathways which are seemingly unrelated. An example with thiamine is that thiamine will theoretically increase the activity of certain enzymes. Let's say enzymes involved in the trans, in the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. Now this is going to potentially increase the requirement for the other B vitamins and the other minerals which are also involved in that cycle you can think of it as like cogs in a machine. It's theoretically possible that what is happening is that by driving these various processes, by increasing the activity of specific pathways, we are increasing the need for riboflavin, for niacin, biotin, B6, folate, and B12, along with other minerals. However, throughout my time working with people, I have generally identified three main areas which 
oftentimes need support and which are responsible or seem to be responsible for producing the negative symptoms associated with thiamine supplementation. Derek Lonsdale has explained on many occasions the, or has emphasized the necessity, the importance of using a good quality magnesium supplement at the same time as using thiamine. Now, I've made another video about this uh, and there's lots of information online about it, but in very simple terms, magnesium is necessary for the activation of thiamine inside cells. Magnesium is also a cofactor for the transketolase enzyme. Magnesium has a regulatory effect on the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. So ultimately, thiamine and magnesium have a very tight-knit relationship and that when you give one, you can increase the requirement for another. That has been found in several studies. Um, so it is very important to be supplementing with magnesium. Now, some people come across Constantini's work and go straight into trying very high doses of, of thiamine HCL. And what they will find is that they develop some negative symptoms. This oftentimes can be addressed simply by taking magnesium. However, one of the other electrolytes which doesn't get as much attention um, and which is something that I've come to understand over the past couple of years is potassium. Now, there are specific symptoms which are quite common in what is referred to as the paradoxical reaction people get from taking thiamine and these symptoms are very similar to an imbalance with potassium, whether it be hyperkalemia, mild hyperkalemia or mild hypokalemia. I tend to see it's more towards hypokalemia, meaning low potassium. And so if we look at the relationship between thiamine and potassium, we see that there are numerous links there as well. Thiamine, uh, when it is deficient in the body, it causes a wasting of potassium through the kidney and causes a secondary mild hypokalemia in and of itself. Thiamine is also necessary for cells to retain potassium. Potassium needs to be retained in the intracellular compartment. And it's been shown that when cells are low in thiamine, they cannot retain potassium as they should do, and they end up accumulating excess sodium instead. Furthermore, thiamine supplementation has been shown to improve the intracellular retention of potassium and also improve the kidney retention of potassium. What I see oftentimes is that when someone takes a high dose of thiamine, this can in some way imbalance their electrolytes. I tend to see uh, low potassium more often than low mag magnesium and I think oftentimes that is because people already know to supplement magnesium, but they don't necessarily, they aren't aware of an effect that this can have on their potassium status. Some of the signs and symptoms that someone may experience if they are developing an electrolyte imbalance when they take high doses of thiamine, I often see tachycardia, I often see frequent urination, um, palpitations, maybe some kind of uh, flutter, uh, mild arrhythmia, or s some abnormality with the heart rate. Uh, headache is very common, excessive thirst. Sometimes a tendency towards sympathetic dominance or insomnia. I found in many cases, if someone does develop a headache from taking thiamine, usually that is responsive to potassium within half an hour to an hour. Um, the recommended kind of intake of magnesium at this, uh, alongside thiamine supplementation is approximately 400 milligrams per day, but that can differ f between different people. Um, the same with potassium. So potassium, people don't often like to supplement that, but I found that when someone does develop these strange symptoms, either related to the heart, related to the ner nervous system, or they develop a headache, let's say, I found that taking uh, 500 milligrams to 2000 milligrams on a daily basis spread out throughout the day can very much help with those symptoms. Now, I'd just like to make clear that the supplemental B vitamins along with the electrolytes 
This is likely to apply to every different form of thiamine. Whereas when we look at the latter two sections of this video, glutathione and methylation, this is primarily going to relate to the TTFD form. The reason I'm, I'm explaining this is because this is a form which generally is the most potent, but it's also most likely to be causing uh, side effects in people. So I think another reason why someone might develop side effects, they might feel sluggish, they might feel tired or fatigued, or they might feel toxic when they take thiamine, the TTFD form, I think that this relates to glutathione status. Now the reason is, is if we look at the very basics of how cells process TTFD, I explained this in my other videos, but in a very brief uh, way, TTFD is a molecule which contains a thiamine molecule, but it also contains a special sulfur mercaptan group. Now, when it is absorbed into cells, it's absorbed whole. In the cell, it needs to be broken apart to release the thiamine molecule, and the sulfur group is going to be detoxified or utilized in a completely different way. So the first step in breaking apart TTFD to cleave free thiamine, as you can see on this diagram, is we're using reduced glutathione and through a process called um, glutathione exchange or disulfide exchange, we are taking a reduced glutathione, oxidizing it, and that, that electron is being donated to the TTFD molecule. And what this does is this cleaves thiamine from TTFD, and that is how we are getting thiamine into the cell to be used for biochemical reactions. And so let's assume that someone has a good ability to recycle their glutathione. Let's say that they already have good glutathione status. Well, this is not necessarily gonna be a problem. TTFD will deplete the reduced glutathione and then they will just recycle it and then they can use the benefits of the thiamine they've gotten from the TTFD. However, on the flip side, if we consider someone who already doesn't have good glutathione status, they already do not have good ability to recycle their glutathione and they go in with high dose TTFD, what that automatically does or what that is going to do very quickly is rapidly tank their glutathione status and then they can't recycle it. Now, keep in mind that glutathione is the primary intracellular antioxidant. It's very important. It's important for detoxification. It's important for protecting cells against the damaging effects of a bunch of different kind of toxic chemicals, right? So if someone reports that they feel toxic, that they feel um, tired, that they feel fatigued, or that they just don't feel very well when they take high dose TTFD or when they take TTFD, this could be one of the reasons why this is theoretically occurring. Something that I found to help people tolerate TTFD, help prepare the cells to deal with TTFD, is doing the, the groundwork. Doing the groundwork, working on building glutathione status, working on building glutathione recycling capacity before we move up to using a therapeutic dose of TTFD. So this would involve providing the nutrients necessary for the pathways which are involved in making glutathione, but also in recycling glutathione. The precursors which we can give for glutathione include glycine, it includes N-acetylcysteine. What we also can do is we can provide the nutrients involved in recycling glutathione, make sure that someone has good riboflavin status, good selenium, niacin, but then also, what I like to add is uh, uh, a normal form of thiamine. So uh, very basic forms such as thiamine hydrochloride in a low dose, because one of the ways that we are recycling glutathione is, is, is through the pentose phosphate pathway. So we do need to, to provide thiamine in some form. I would start off with a low dose thiamine, 
um, providing those supporting nutrients. And then what I would also probably consider is using some preformed glutathione. So in a liposomal form, it's, it's, it's fairly well absorbed. And I would start quite low, working up to 500 milligrams per day. Now, what I often find is that after doing this for anywhere between three to six to eight weeks, really working on, on trying to um, improve someone's glutathione status, I find that then we can move adding in, adding in a low dose of TTFD, and it's oftentimes it's better tolerated. Finally, there is a connection between TTFD and methylation. And I think that this is one of the reasons, or at least one factor which can help to explain some of the strange symptoms. So in the previous diagram, we looked at how thiamine TTFD is depleting glutathione. The reason why it's doing this is because we're using glutathione to actually reduce the molecule. We're donating electrons to the TTFD molecule, breaking apart TTFD, releasing thiamine, and catching it or capturing it inside the cells. Now, if we go back to this other diagram, we see that there is the mecaptan group. And you see the arrow going down, it's, it's conjugated with more glutathione, and then it needs to be processed further. And the way that we're processing it next is we're using methylation. So we use an enzyme called thiol S-methyltransferase. We are taking the methyl group from SAMe, S-adenosylmethionine, and we're docking that onto the TTFD breakdown product, and that's, that's gonna produce methyl tetrahydrofurfural disulfide. Now, this is the molecule that we are primarily gonna be clearing out and detoxifying through the liver out through the kidneys. Now, if you know anything about methylation, you understand that SAMe is the primary methyl donor inside the human body, okay? SAMe is generated from methionine. It's, um, it contributes or it, it functions to donate its, its methyl group um, in a variety of different reactions, and it serves various purposes. Now, most will be familiar with the concept of poor methylation, and this is a fairly common occurrence, I believe. Now, let's assume that someone is already a poor methylator, or that someone has a tendency towards generating lower amounts of SAMe. Well, what taking TTFD is going to do, theoretically at least, not only does it temporarily tank glutathione or reduce glutathione status, but it's also going to be using up SAMe, okay? SAMe is going to be one of the primary ways in which we are detoxing this molecule. So let's assume that someone has poor glutathione status and recycling capacity. Furthermore, this same someone also has poor methylation. They are not very well able to generate SAMe or recycle homocysteine back to, uh, back to methionine. They have this tendency towards low SAMe in the first place. What TTFD is potentially going to be doing is it's going to be depleting reduced glutathione further and it's also going to be depleting SAMe. This is one of the reasons why someone may develop symptoms of poor methylation simply by taking TTFD. And I've seen this on numerous occasions. In fact, some of the primary symptoms here, and these symptoms do overlap quite significantly with one another, but some of the symptoms that I've seen occur through TTFD supplementation particularly anxiety, racing thoughts, agitation, maybe poor concentration. Something I've seen on, on a few occasions is all of a sudden a feeling of histamine intolerance, unable to properly tolerate histamine in foods. Sometimes someone may feel like they are over, overrun with adrenaline or noradrenaline, this feeling of sympt sympathetic dominance, but other times, people might feel depressed or very flat. How might someone address this? Well, in some of these cases, the people find that their symptoms disappear through taking a supplement or a nutrient which is going to improve methylation. 
some of the, the supplements or nutrients that I might recommend for people and which sometimes work, one of those is going to be S-adenosylmethionine. Another one may be choline. It may be increasing methionine through the diet or even supplemental L-methionine can help. Giving methylated forms of folate and methylated B12. Trimethylglycine. Now, ideally, the idea is to support the body's ability to generate more SAMe or to recycle homocysteine back to methionine and sub subsequently generate SAMe to replete what is being lost through taking TTFD. Finally, another pathway in the liver exists called sulf sulfoxidation, and this is the final mechanism of clearance of TTFD. Now, for some reason, people find that when they take molybdenum, this greatly helps with some of the symptoms that they associate with sulfur that they develop from taking TTFD. So I mentioned that TTFD, the TFD portion of that is a sulfur molecule. It's similar to an organosulfur compound. Um, it's very similar to allicin, which is found in garlic. Now, if someone classically does not or, or typically does not tolerate sulfur compounds very well, one of the specific nutrients which is usually advised to these people is molybdenum. Molybdenum is going to act as a cofactor for an enzyme called sulfite oxidase. What this is going to help to do is clear excess sulfite and um, convert that into bioavailable sulfate or inorganic sulfate, which can be used for other purposes. What we do see is that some people, when they take TTFD, they may develop very severe sulfur type symptoms. This can be flushing, this can be headaches, it may be anxiety, it may be palpitations. However, in a few cases, molybdenum can help to very much calm this system down. Now, I'm not entirely sure why that would work because I can't see any reason why TTFD would generate sulfite. That's just because I haven't come across anything in the literature and I've searched and I've searched for it, but I could be completely missing something and I'm 100% open to this possibility that what might be happening is that if someone has a tendency to, towards being unable to clear excess sulfite, um, then taking molybdenum is going to help that. And these people do seem to benefit from taking molybdenum with thymine and that can help those symptoms. Sometimes it can, it can help with body odor and things like that. So ultimately this is something which I usually recommend that people try. I would go no higher than 200 micrograms of molybdenum, let's, let's say. But this is definitely something which, um, which does seem to help. So overall, uh, we've got kind of three main areas that I spoke about. We have magnesium, we have potassium, we have glutathione, glutathione recycling, and we also have methylation and methyl donor depletion. Finally, we have this sulfoxidation pathway. We have molybdenum, and those are, in a roundabout way, those are the main areas that I find people need to work on if they can't tolerate TTFD and if they want to be able to. Now, as I said previously, TTFD tends to be the most potent form. That being said, there are some people who I think simply are not compatible with this molecule as a nutritional supplement and rather they find benefit from other forms instead. And that is perfectly okay. So if someone prefers um, thymine pyrophosphate, if someone prefers thymine hydrochloride, if someone prefers benfotiamine and they do better with that, then that's excellent. There is no right or wrong answer. It's finding out what works for each different person and going with that. And to some extent, these same principles can be applied. This video is very... However, this video is quite specific for TTFD, simply because um, the way that this is metabolized is directly affecting these systems that I've spoken about in this video today. So I hope that you found this video helpful. I also hope that you now have a better understanding of some of the areas that someone can work on 
to allow their body to better process thiamine and better adapt to higher doses. If you like this video or you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my page. You can find uh, my website, www.eo nutrition. You can also find me on Facebook as EO nutrition. I will be making more videos like this in the future. Um, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to pop me an email or get in contact with me via some other way. Other than that, um, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.